Max Chadwick, an analyst from Pro Football Focus, joins today's show to talk about the state of the Giants, how the 2024 draft played out, and an early look at the 2025 draft. That's coming your way next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Locked On Giants podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, credentialed member of the New York Giants media for Locked On, as well as for New York Giants on SI. You can find our written work over at si.com slash NFL slash Giants and a special welcome on in to my Blue Crew community members, to my everydayers, my newcomers, and everybody in between. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. And on today's show, I'm joined by Max Chadwick. He is a an, an analyst for Pro Football Focus. He does college football. He also does the NFL. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Giants, and we're also going to talk a little bit about next year's draft class. So, Max, welcome on in. Thank you so much for joining me. No, of course. It's an honor to be on with you, honestly. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today. All right. Well, we're excited to hear from you as well. All right. Next. So let's start off. Uh, we're going to start with the Giants, obviously, since this is a Giants podcast. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm always interested in how pro football focus comes up with, you know, the grades that it comes up with for like the draft class and all that stuff. Can you give us a little insight into what goes into that? Because obviously not all drafts are created equal. Is it more heavily weighed towards need? Is it more towards value or is it somewhere in between? I think it's somewhere in between, and I actually don't do the grades. Our, our lead draft analyst, Trevor Sycama, uh, who's the best in the business, in my opinion, uh, he does all the grades. But, yeah, it's a little bit in between, right? You know, you obviously every team goes into an NFL draft with a you know set amount of needs on their roster and how you address them in the draft it gets taken into account. Uh, and also, obviously, you want to draft really good players. So how, where they were ranked on our big board also gets taken into account. So it's not really, you know, a perfect science. You know, you kind of have to blend the two together of, okay, did they address their needs? Also, did they draft good players or did they reach, you know, and, and take guys way earlier than we thought they should have been picked? So uh, it's a little bit of both, which, which is how we uh, try to get um, our, our draft grades for, uh, for the website. So sort of like how the NFL approaches it, I'm sure. <laughs> So anyway, when you look at the offseason that the New York Giants had between the free agent losses and gains, and then you throw in the draft class, did the Giants get better, worse, or did they stay the same in your opinion? I, I think they definitely got a, a little bit better. I mean, obviously you get a, a guy like Malik Neighbors at, uh, in, in the top five that um, they did a really good job of, of getting him, and they have a true number one receiver now, right, which you can't say that they have in, they've had in, in a long time. Obviously, trading for Brian Burns is another huge move um, to go along with Kayvon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence. I mean, it's a very fearsome defensive line all of a sudden they have now. Obviously, uh, it's not all great. I mean, they lost some really talented players like Xavier McKinney, Saquon Barkley, obviously. Um, Devin Singletary should help out there. And I do love Tyrone Tracy, the running back they took on day three of the draft. I think he's a really, really underrated player. And I think he could be the Giants running back uh, number one of the future. Um, but yeah, I think they, they did a pretty good job. And I thought the draft was pretty good too. I mean, Malik Neighbors, is, like I said, is a top five pick that they got at receiver. Tyler Newbin's the best safety in the draft. So that helps the, the loss of Xavier McKinney. Um, I think they, you know, obviously quarterback situation is still a question mark for this team, but I think they're going to roll into next year with Daniel Jones and Drew Locke. And then if they have another bad year, maybe they go into the 2025 quarterback class a little bit. But yeah, overall, I think it was a really, really solid offseason for the Giants. And we actually, uh, we, we did offseason grades as well. We actually gave the Giants a B plus for their offseason. So overall, really solid offseason for the Giants. You, you mentioned uh, the loss of Saquon Barkley. Just how big is that? I mean, he was basically their most important player, more, most important skill position player, I should say, last year, you know, and, and he even had some injury issues. But how big of a loss do you think that really is for this Giants offense that really needs, you know, to have a good season this year? 
Yeah, I think it was pretty big, right? And I know PFF has kind of been at the forefront of running backs don't matter as much as people think they do. So obviously, I don't want to get fired by saying he's really important to the offense. But I think he was. I, I thought he was a critical piece, not only as a runner, but also as a receiver as well. Uh, he's one of the better running backs that we have in the NFL. Now, fortunately, like I said, um, the running back position is just not as valuable as it once was decades ago, right? So I think it's not something that's devastating to a team when you lose a star running back. And Devin Singletary is more than capable. And like I said, I love the pick of Tyron Tracy as well on day three of the draft. So um, it's not as bad as, say, losing a a you know top wide receiver or top corner or top edge defender or something like that. Uh, but it is still a, one of their best players in their team, obviously. So it, it is definitely a loss. But um, it's definitely not as devastating those other positions if you uh, if you want to ask me that. If you had to pick one move that was underrated, made by the Giants or not made by the Giants, what would it be? Ooh, underrated move. I'm trying to think. Um, I really like. I, I'm going to go back to the draft. I, I think the Tyler Newbin pick is really good. I, I think he was clearly the best safety in the draft. Um, and like I said, they lost Xavier McKinney, so they had a clear need at safety heading into the draft. Um, and, and they got the, the by far, in my opinion, the best safety on the board. He was the best safety in college football this past season, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think the pick of Tyler Newbin, you know, obviously Malik Neighbors is getting all the hype and deservedly so. But I think Tyler Newbin is, is going to be a really sneaky uh, player for them. And also, again, I, I'm going to shout him out as much as I can on this podcast. But uh, I, I really, really do think Tyrone Tracy is going to be a breakout star for New York. And I think getting him on day three, when you had kind of a need at running back to go along with Devin Singletary, uh, I think Tyrone Tracy is going to be a guy that breaks out for the team next year. So I'll say the two picks of Tyler Newbin and Tyrone Tracy are the two uh, picks I really was a big fan of for them. Were you surprised that the Giants didn't take a quarterback in this draft? I don't think I was. I, I think, you know, they were in a spot where I don't think I would have either. I, I think they clearly needed a wide receiver. I think obviously you paid a lot of money to Daniel Jones, so it's going to be hard to get out of that contract. So if you drafted a quarterback, it's going to make kind of an awkward situation there with him, with a quarterback that you're paying $40 million a year um, and then also a, a first-round draft pick. So um, I don't think it was a mistake. No, and obviously if Drake May was there, I would have taken Drake May. Um, and if the price to move up for Drake May – wasn't so steep. I know New England was asking for a lot. Then I would have done that if I was New York, but he was taken with a third overall pick. So obviously you couldn't take him. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have taken JJ McCarthy or Michael Penix Jr. or, or Bo Nix over Malik Neighbors. So I, I don't think the Giants really messed up at all, not taking uh, one of those top six quarterbacks in the draft. One streak may went off the board. Were there realistically any of those other quarterbacks, top quarterbacks that were an ideal fit for the system that the Giants run? I think the one guy that we've heard rumblings about the Giants really liking all along was J.J. McCarthy, and there was part of me that thought, okay, does does Brian Day will pull the trigger here, right? Because I think um, we are all expecting the Vikings to trade up to the top five to get J.J. McCarthy so that way the Giants don't have an opportunity to select him. That obviously didn't happen, and J.J. McCarthy was there staring the Giants in the face at the number six overall pick, and clearly um, a lot of the stuff we heard about J.J. McCarthy was a smokescreen because they passed on him and took um, and took Malik Neighbors. So um, I think that was the quarterback, though, that I was most expecting the Giants to take at six if he was there with J.J. McCarthy, if they were going to take a quarterback. Um, but like I said, I think they made the right call going with Malik Neighbors, who's easily a top five talent in this draft and easily fits one of the biggest needs in this roster, which is finding a number one receiver. Do you think Malik Neighbors can, quote unquote, save Daniel Jones, who's I think on the bubble this year, needs to have a good year? Um, obviously injuries have not helped him. The offensive line play has not helped him, but do you think Malik neighbors can be that missing ingredient that helps push Daniel Jones's game back to where, you know, where it should have been all along, assuming he gets good offensive line play. Yeah, that's going to be right. The offensive line is huge next year. I, I think Malik neighbors is a true alpha number one receiver. And I think there are three of them in this draft and Marvin Harrison, Jr. Malik neighbors and Roma Dunze and the Giants did a really good job of getting, uh, in my opinion, the second best receiver in this draft in, uh, in Malik neighbors. So, um, I think it'll certainly help. I don't, I don't know if he's going to you know, save Daniel Jones's career or anything like that. Um, this is obviously a big year for, for Daniel Jones, but they still need more weapons. I, I like Darius Slayton. I like Wondell Robinson, but still, you know, even with Malik Neighbors, they're still kind of a below average receiving core at, at best, honestly. Um, so I still think there's more to do for New York. And obviously the, the big story is whether or not Darren Waller is going to retire or not. Um, so that's another big, big, uh, issue too, but I, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction though. And like I said, it was the exact pick that I would have made if I was a giant at number six overall. So, um, I, I don't know if that'll, you know, fully fix the offense, especially losing a guy like Saquon Barkley too, but it definitely is a, is a big step in the right direction for New York. When you look at Daniel Jones's game, you know, obviously injuries have been a, a problem for him. And again, I'm not discounting the 
the injuries to the offense, I'm sorry, to the play of the offensive line, you know, Darren Waller getting hurt, Saquon Barkley missing times, not having a number one receiver. But at some point we've got to look at Daniel Jones and, and say to ourselves, what has been missing from his game for like the last, you know, five, six years of his career? What has carried over from Duke to the NFL that still isn't quite where it needs to be? I think he has always been pretty careless uh, with the football with the football, excuse me, as um, a lot of fumbles at Duke that we saw in his career. And, and that's kind of carried over to the NFL too. I also think, you know, he's a good runner as a position, but um, I, I don't think he's that great of a passer uh, either right now. So I, I, th- I think he's just a below average quarterback overall. And I think we kind of knew that. I mean, he was taken very much higher than a lot of people expected him to be with the six overall pick when a lot of people said, Oh, this guy's a second or third round pick. And so taking him in six overall was a shock to a lot of people, including myself. And he's exactly like kind of who we thought he was, um, maybe even a little bit better than what we thought he was going to the draft. But certainly, I don't think worthy of being a, a number six overall pick. So um, I think a lot of Giants fans would agree with that right now. And I think obviously you paid a lot of money to him after that one playoff run, and, that, and you know a lot of people kind of groaned when they saw that contract extension. And now it's it's not looking great for New York. So now they're in a tough bind uh, as to what to do at quarterback right now. So I do think Daniel Jones is kind of on his, on his last legs in New York. Um, and I, I just I, I don't think he's a, you know, top half of the league passer, in my opinion, which is ultimately if you're not that you're, it's going to be really tough for you to find a job in the NFL. What about his post snap decision making? I mean, when I look at his game, that to me kind of sticks out like a sore thumb that he's slow to make a decision. Hence, he misses guys who might be open, you know, those short windows that they might be open. He was reluctant last year to, to, to really, you know, throw the ball down the field, I suspect, because the year prior when he was with Joe Judge, he was coached to not take chances and stuff like that. But what do you see as far as, you know, what's holding him back in in his game, besides obviously the carelessness with the ball that you described before? Yeah, I think I think that's a good point by you. I think the, the slow decision-making, um, the processing speed is not all the way there yet uh, either. And again, I just don't think he's – that talented of a passer. I, I don't think he's got elite arm strength or anything like that. Um, his accuracy wanes at times. Um, and I think at, at his best, he was like a average quarterback in the NFL. And I don't think he's ever really been more than that, honestly. And obviously injuries have been a, a big part of his career, especially this past season as well. So um, I, I think that, yeah, I just don't think he's a talented enough passer to ever be a top 15 or top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Um, and if you don't have a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, in my opinion, you should always kind of keep chasing that until you find one. And he's definitely not one, in my opinion. All right. We've got more coming up with Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus. Don't go anywhere. Hey, Giant fans. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Not into the NBA or NHL? Then check out the odds for other leagues like MLB, WNBA, PGA, and more. No matter what you're into, you'll find something that matches your interests. And you'll want to be part of all the action. Because right now, when you sign up for an account with FanDuel, you will get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, with special guest Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus. And Max, I want to stay on quarterbacks for a moment, but I want to look at the 2025 class of quarterbacks. Now, I know, obviously, we got to still find out who's coming out and everything like that, but how is that that 2025 quarterbacks class shaping up, in your opinion? It's definitely worse than this past year. We're not going to have six guys go in the top 12. I can guarantee you that, uh, which was a record, by the way. Um, I, I think it's it's okay right now. It's not great. There isn't a Caleb Williams. There isn't a Drake May. You know, last summer we all knew Caleb Williams was going to be a, a top three pick in the draft. It's not the number one overall pick, which he ended up being. We all knew Drake May was going to be a top three pick in the NFL draft. So we knew those guys. There isn't that guy this year, right? It's, it's a lot of unknowns right now. I think Carson Beck from Georgia is my pick to be QB one. I think his timing, his precision, his accuracy. He's a great pocket passer. Um, I don't think he's ever going to be much of a, a runner, and I think his arm is um, good, not great. 
But uh, he is just so – he's so in command of the offense, and he, and he knows exactly what to do on every single play. He does not hold on to the ball for a long time. And like I say, he's extremely accurate too. He's my pick for QB1. I think Shador Sanders from Colorado is right behind him. I think Sanders is an advanced processor um, who can – uh, really read a defense extremely well. Again, the tools aren't spectacular, but like I said, he is such a smart, smart quarterback. Uh, and even with a bad offensive line at Colorado, he still produced uh, really well last year. So um, he's another guy to watch out for. And then actually Trevor Sikama, I've been talking to Trevor about, you know, he's watching the 2025 quarterbacks right now for an episode for his NFL Stock Exchange podcast, which you guys should check out if you want. It's our draft podcast at PFF. And he's watching him right now, and he actually has – Connor Wegman from Texas A&M as his QB one as of right now, he told me. So um, Wegman is a former five-star recruit, looked amazing this past season in four games, and then he suffered a season-ending foot injury. Um, so obviously you want to see how he bounces back from that, and there's not a lot of tape to go off of from Wegman, but he is a very, very talented player too. So it's a very, very wide open quarterback class this next year, and there isn't a true you know, alpha number one guy like there was last year with Caleb Williams and Drake May. And then obviously other guys emerged in that class as well. There isn't that, that number one guy, but I don't think it's as bad as the 2022 quarterback class was, at least not yet. Uh, I, I think there are more options than we had in the uh, 2022 class right now. Are there guys who are underclassmen that, you know, right now we don't know if they're going to declare or not that if they do end up declaring could maybe improve the class? Yeah, I think there are a few guys. I think it's a very older quarterback class next year. I think a lot of the top guys in this year's draft, and uh, excuse me, next year's draft, could have declared for this year's draft if they wanted to. Carson Beck being one of them, Shador Sanders being one of them, Quinn Ewers from Texas uh, being one of them as well. As for true juniors, the guys I would I would look at are, are again Connor Wegman from Texas and M that I mentioned before. Uh, Drew Aller from Penn State is very very talented, but Penn State doesn't really allow him to be the best version of himself for a lot of reasons for the receiving core being really bad. The offensive line isn't great. The play calling was abysmal last year. So he's kind of been hamstrung a lot by Penn state, but he's a very, very talented player. Uh, and then another guy, I think Noah Fafita from Arizona uh, was a really, really fun player to watch last year. The issue with him is that he's kind of like around the same size as Bryce young right now, which and obviously that was a huge issue with Bryce young coming out. Uh, so Fafita, I don't think will ever be a, a first round player caliber quarterback but he's, he's a really fun player too but yeah to answer your question this is a this is a much older quarterback class like i said a lot of the top guys for next year could have been in this year's draft if they wanted to all right let's get back to the giants i want to talk about the defensive side of the ball and how much does brian burns's arrival change the complexion of that giants defense in your opinion I think it's huge. I, I think he's obviously a, a, an electric pass rusher, and he's one of the most athletic edge defenders we have in the NFL. And I think getting him with Kayvon Thibodeau on the other side is a really, really fun duo. And Kayvon Thibodeau also a freak athlete too. So um, I think it's great. I, I think obviously you have a top two defensive tackle in the NFL probably in Dexter Lawrence. I mean, it really is a, a fearsome defensive line that all of a sudden New York built just by trading for Brian Burns. So I, I think it's a huge addition for them, honestly. And I think their pass rusher is going to be really something to uh, – keep in mind next year and they're going to be a, a really uh, formidable pass rushing unit next year in my opinion based on what you know about Shane Bowen the new defensive coordinator who was with Tennessee uh, the last couple of years and the talent that the Giants have do you feel that most of the guys the Giants have are going to be a decent enough fit for what Bowen might want to do based on his history in, in Tennessee or do you think there's still a few players off uh, I still think they're. Uh, I still think they can improve in some areas, but I do think that the defense will be the best part of their team next year. Uh, like I said, I think they have a a really good defensive line. Um, their linebacker core is is okay. Bobby Okereke is is a good player. Michael McFadden solid, and then the defensive backfield is is decent too. You know, obviously Drew Phillips coming in to play probably nickel corner. Tyler uh, Tyler Newbin play uh, safety. Um, Deontay Banks is a former first round pick. You're, you're kind of hoping he's going to take another step forward as well. Um, I, think, I still think the secondary can be improved, but yeah, I think with a, a great D line though, getting quarterbacks under pressure pretty quickly, that'll help the rest of the defense really uh, gel together. Cause uh, if a quarterback's under pressure quickly, he's going to get rid of that ball quickly or get sacks and that makes everyone else's jobs much easier too. So um, I, I am expecting the giants defense to be probably the best unit of the uh, team next year. You also look at the, the differences in philosophy scheme wise, Wink Martindale lived and died with the blitz. I mean, he, he brought guys in from the secondary to blitz. Uh, Shane Bowen wants to get home with the front seven guys. How much of a difference do you think that is going to make in terms of masking any deficiencies, particularly in the backfield, the defensive backfield where, you know, they've got Deontay Banks, who's a solid cover cornerback. 
but there's still some question marks about cornerback too. Right now it looks like it's going to be Cordell flat, but mm -hmm. you know, is it, it's, we don't know for sure how that's going to work out. So how much do you think that the change in the defensive philosophy is going to help, you know, mask the deficiencies on the defense? I think with Wink Martindale, you know, having a very, very blitz happy approach, like you said, it's important to have a great secondary behind it because obviously when you blitz, you have fewer players that can play in coverage, right? So um, it's important to have a great secondary. Now I think it's really good because the Giants can rush four, say, and then have seven players in uh, in coverage, which would, would, would really help. And I, honestly, like that actually will really help a, a secondary that, like I said, that isn't great right now. So um, the fact that I think that they're going to rush four a lot more, and also the fact that I think that that four can really get home at a good enough level with Brian Burns and Dexter Lawrence and Kayvon Thibodeau and even Jordan Phillips a little bit too, um, th that four will get home uh, at a good at a good rate in my opinion. So and then like I said, if you have seven guys in the back end, that that'll be really good when you're you have like four receivers or five receivers to guard right so um I, I think that's that's a great uh that's a great thing for this defense is that they're not going to hopefully blitz as much and because of that they'll have more players to uh to play in coverage to to make up and mask a uh, a below average secondary right now all right we've got more coming up at pro football focus is max chadwick right after this hey giant fans with the dead period coming up in the NFL calendar, I'm really looking forward to catching some shows and concerts in the area. And no matter what event I end up choosing, I never have to worry about getting tickets thanks to Game Time. With Game Time, there are always great seats available at competitive prices. They even offer last minute money saving deals and they take away the guesswork as far as fees, seat views, and other aspects that can make ticket buying a nightmare. Game Time even offers event cancellation protection, and if you find tickets elsewhere in the same section and roll for less, Game Time will give you 110% of the difference. So go on and get the event tickets you've been wanting. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Terms apply. Hey, Giant fans. Have you checked out Locked On Sports Today, the first ever national 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube? Locked On Sports Today is here for you all day, every day, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trainer, with special guest Max Chadwick of Pro Football Focus. And Max, I want to go back to the offensive side of the ball for the Giants. And specifically, I want to look at the offensive line, which was really a disaster last year. Now, I know, you know, they gave up 85 sacks, but not all of those sacks were on the offensive line. Some of the quarterbacks just held on to the ball way too long. But I want to start off with the right side of the offensive line, and in particular, Evan Neal, who in two, se two seasons has just not looked like a top seven draft pick. When you look at his tape and his grades and his history and everything like that, what's missing in his game so far? Uh, I, st I think pass protection has been a disaster for him, honestly, to start his career. And, and we've had these issues with him before. You know, coming out of Alabama, he was talked about as this really boomer bust player in a lot of ways because of how freaky of an athlete he is. I mean, he is a terrific, terrific athlete. Um, but the problem is balance is a huge issue for him in Alabama. Um, and just technique-wise, he wasn't great. And, and now you see, you know, those issues rearing their ugly head right now. Um, and he's been in a, frankly, an abysmal pass blocker this, these past couple of years. You know, he actually out of eighty uh, out of eighty one tackles in the NFL that that played enough snaps to to be ranked in our database, he had the second worst pass blocking grade last year. So eightieth out of eighty one uh, qualifying tackles. So um, he's a little bit better as a run blocker, but he also isn't great there either. He's sixty fifth uh, in run blocking grade, so it's not like he's very good either. Um, I think through two years so far, he's. You could say it. he's been a bust through two years so far. Now, he can still become a, a quality player. We saw guys like Andrew Thomas, who was terrible his rookie year, and now has turned into one of the best tackles in the NFL. Not quite sure who hit that high that Andrew Thomas has, but uh, there is still a very, very high ceiling there with Evan Neal. Um, but I, I do think this year three for him is huge. Because uh, if, he's, if he's still as bad as he was in the first two years, 
the, some conversations we've had with the Giants about, okay, we need to find a, a different answer here uh, at tackle. Um, and I, I think that uh, he's just – right now, as of right now, he's been he's been pretty bad. So I, I think, uh, yeah, Evan Neal is a big year three for him. He's got to prove that he could be a starting tackle in this league. Now, if I remember correctly, at Alabama, Evan Neal played right tackle, I want to say his – not not his last year, but the year prior to that, yes. which is what kind of gave the Giants the idea that he could play right tackle. But for, if I'm not mistaken, I think Evan Neal mostly played on the left side. How much do you think it is a comfort level with him and that he played most of his snaps on the left side and now he's being asked to play on the right side? It's kind of like learning to write, you know, if you're right-handed, learning to write with your left hand all over again. Yes, it is a little bit, right, like that. And I, I think – I'm trying to remember exactly where he played his freshman year because he did start, I believe, as, as a true freshman. He, I, I think, think he left at, guard. Left I guard, think. yeah, left guard and then right tackle and then left tackle. So he played three right. years at Alabama. He played three different positions at Alabama. Um, so now, obviously, he played it before at Alabama, and he was pretty solid at right tackle. Um, but obviously switching over from left tackle to right tackle in the NFL, uh, it is a learning curve, right? And it's already a, a big learning curve for an office alignment in general. Um, it's even bigger when you have to switch a position too. So um, – yeah, I do think it's a little bit of that. I think comfortability is definitely uh, an issue for him right now. Um, and like I said, he's got all the talent in the world to to be a not only a capable starting tackle, but one of the better starting tackles we have in the league. But he's got to put all those tools together and, and really get a lot better in a lot of ways, namely his balance and his technique and his hand usage and all that. Because uh, right now, like I said, he's he's certainly been one of the worst starting tackles we've had in the NFL through through his last you know his first two years so far. Now, what's interesting is that the OTAs that have been open to the media, um, they have had John Runyon play right guard in the OTAs. John Runyon uh, having expressed, an ex uh, I think, a preference for playing left guard, they've had him play at right guard. And my philosophy there is that maybe they feel that having Runyon next to Evan Neal is going to help him. Can you talk a little bit about how having – an experienced, decent guard next to a young tackle who's maybe struggling can help him get better? I think it's huge. I, I think John Runyon's a really solid player, um, and he's been that you know over the last few years. I don't think he's a, he's not a superstar or anything like that, but he's a solid player. And like you said, he has a, a veteran presence in that locker room too. I mean, he's, he's, played, he's entering, I think, his fourth or fifth season right now um, in the NFL, so not a super old player, but I do think it's big. You know, I think it is big for him to, um, to be uh, – there with Evan Neal. And also uh, I think it's smart because Jermaine Alumenor, um, who's a guy that played tackle for most of his career, he's probably going to be starting left guard for, for New York. So it makes sense for New York to put your the brand new left guard uh, on the left side where you have an excellent left tackle in Andrew Thomas to kind of help him out. And then you put the experienced right guard on the right side where you have a right tackle has been really struggling through his first two years. So I think that makes a lot of sense. It would have, been, it would have made much sense for Runyon and Andrew Thomas to be on the same side of the field and dominate there and then have the brand new offensive guard and a, a really struggling right tackle on the right side. So that, that wouldn't have made too much sense. Um, so that, I think that's why they did it. I think it's a great point by you that, yeah, they, they want to put the guy who's comfortable playing guard uh, with Evan Neal and hopefully can kind of help him out in that aspect and, uh, and bring him along and hopefully he can make that year three jump. When you look at Evan Neal, do you see more of a of a guard as opposed to a tackle, or you know, do you think he's salvageable? I think he's definitely salvageable. Yeah, I, I definitely do. I think um, he can play guard long term, and that honestly might be a a thing that Giants want to do. You know, if if Evan Neal say really struggles next year, um, I know quarterback is going to be at the top of their needs going into the draft, but it also is a really good offensive tackle class with two guys uh, headlining in Will Campbell from LSU and Kelvin Banks Jr. from Texas. I could see that being a thing where they go, okay, let's take one of those guys. Let's put Evan on the inside, um, and hopefully he can get better as, a, as an offensive guard than on an island as a tackle, and they'll put Campbell or Banks uh, as the starting right tackle opposite of Andrew Thomas. So I could see that being a, a long-term play for them too if Evan Neal still really struggles in year three. Uh, I, I think it's a pivotal year three for him, right? I think I don't know if he'll get cut if he has another terrible season, but I, I do think if he has another really bad year, Conversations to be had for the Giants to maybe draft a, a really good tackle at the top of the draft or to sign a really good tackle. That way you can put Evan Neal on the interior off his line. So I think this is a massive year three for him to prove that he can be a starting tackle in the league. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, like I said, it's, it's pivotal for him this year. Final question for you, Max. When you look at this Giants team, obviously they it, it's a big year. Year three for Joe Shane and Brian Dable. 
Uh, they're coming off of a six and 11 season where they took a step back from the first season. What do they need to do to produce more wins? Um, you know, and you can look at both sides of the ball, but where do they need to be better both sides of the ball to get this ship back on course? Uh, I, I think Daniel Jones has to show again, what he, what he showed a couple years ago that he can be a, at least average quarterback in the NFL. And I think Malik neighbors needs to come in immediately and be an electric playmaker for them. Um, I think that's important. I think Evan Neal is huge. I think that offensive line needs to gel uh, a lot next year. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, the Giants had one of the worst offenses in the league uh, last year. So that's definitely a big area of improvement. And the defense wasn't too much better either. So um, I think a lot of things need to go right for the Giants next year. And I think uh, the Brian Burns addition needs to be huge. I think they need to get after the passer really well and help out that secondary. Um, and uh, I think the secondary needs to – Deontay Banks needs to needs to come into his own as a – you know, former first round pick too. So uh, a lot of things need to uh, break the giants way this year for them not to be probably one of the 10 worst teams in the NFL again. It also would help if they would stay healthy. They've been leading the league right. or, or at the top five in injuries. Like I, I don't know how many years now in a row. And that's been a problem. Yeah. It's been huge. That, that is, again, that's the name of the game of the NFL almost, you know, because so many of these guys are capable to play in the NFL. Obviously they're all here. Uh, but staying healthy is, is massive. And I think it was really underrated when you're talking about teams too. So yeah, also staying healthy. So maybe the, uh, the training staff for the giants needs to uh, have a big year as well. Yeah. I mean, cause when they get injured the way they have, it exposes the lack of depth that right. is developed and ready to step in. So that's a huge thing. Max appreciate you coming on. He is Max Chadwick of pro football focus. You can find his work over at pff.com. Keep it here all week. Giants fans. We've got another OTA coming up. We'll have more guests for you, more analysis as we continue our off season coverage of the Giants OTA program from Max Chadwick. I'm Patricia Trainer. Thank you for spending time with us today and we shall see you tomorrow.